dudes! Welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s-themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical! Now today, I have a special treat for all you Star Wars fans who grew up in the 80s. I will be interviewing the star of the 1984 and 85 Ewok Adventure TV Movies of the Week, Eric Walker. Yes, Eric Walker, the kid who played Mace. I will have him on the show today to talk about uh, making those TV classics and working with the Ewoks. And, of course, he did other things. He uh, was in the TV movie of the week, Having It All. He was on Webster. He was in the TV, the TV Disney movie, Little Spies. He was in the 1987 Robert Downey Jr. cult classic, Less Than Zero. And he did a bunch of other things. Oh, and he was also in She's Out of Control, playing a volleyball player. I got to ask him about that. Like, what the fuck? Playing a, a volleyball or in that movie. So it's going to be great. It's going to be spectacular and awesome. So yeah, here is my interview with Eric Walker. Awesome. Welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm good. Nice. This is such a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. No, my pleasure. <laughs> so, going back in time, um, you were a child actor. I was reading that uh, your father moved you guys to San Fernando Valley following a job he got with Sunkist, and um, you did a Jack in the Box commercial, and then tragedy struck. Yeah. Um, yeah, my mother passed away. I was a very, very young. I just I just uh, turned six years old, so it was um, so she didn't actually get a chance to see that commercial. So, oh, absolutely. But, you know, she's looking. I don't want to turn it into a downer. She's yeah. not sure she's seen everything. So I believe that. So yes, I believe it too. I'm so sorry, man. That's awful. But uh, she was uh, instrumental in you getting into acting in the first place, right? Oh yeah. She, it was her dream to have her kids get into acting, uh, do commercials and stuff like that. It was one of her, uh, you know, things she always wanted to do, to get us into. So, mm -hmm. and I was able to do that. And then because I was such a young kid, my dad wasn't so sure. He wanted to make sure I was serious. So I really didn't continue after that. And he made me kind of still say I wanted to do it for like a two or three year period before he finally caved in. So I started with the Jack in the Box commercial, but then I didn't do anything or get into acting until about two or three years after that. So, Yeah. Did you think to yourself, I'm going to be the next uh, Rodney Allen Rippey? <laughs> no, no, no. I think at the time I was, I was, I was so young, I, I got the Jack in the Box food. And I mm -hmm. loved to love the food, and then I got paid like three hundred dollars for the day. So it was, it was a, oh, I could get some money and uh, you know eat so eat fast food. So it was like a it was, you know how a kid is getting a chance to eat fast food, you know? Yeah, <laughs> which is not a good thing, but it's at the not, time, yeah, at the time sure. that it was. Were you were you doing any um, plays at school? Not until later. When I was in high school, I went to the L.A. County High School for, for, for the Performing Arts, which started here. I was in the first graduating class. started here in the 80s. It's like the same school in New York. Mm -hmm. But the one here in Los Angeles, I was started in the late 80s. And I went when I went to high school, I did plays. And uh, since then, <clears throat> uh, that school's had quite a few very famous alumni that went there. Josh Groban, mm -hmm. our school. Uh, Fergie from the Black Eyed Peas. Jenna <laughs> Elfin. Uh, Anthony Anderson uh, on Blackish uh, was actually in my class. We went to high school together. Mm -hmm. so, I've, been, um, I've been talking to a lot of people lately who knew Fergie when when she was just starting out. That's just uh, so profound, you know. They all knew that she was yep. going to make it, you know. Yep, and she 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 was a graduate from the same high school for the it's called the L.A. County High School for the Performing Arts. Uh, and what's neat about it is it's on uh, a college campus. It's on Cal State LA's campus. So it was a little bit of a trek to get to the high school every day, but 
it was well worth it. Mm -hmm. You're originally uh, from Upland? I was born in Upland, but we moved to the San Fernando Valley when I was, like, very young. I was still an infant when we, we moved to Sherman Oaks, which is part of the San Fernando Valley. Yeah, I have an aunt. Or looking it up. Yeah, I have an aunt who lives in Upland, and uh, I stayed at her house one weekend right. to go to a horror convention in Burbank. Oh, my God, what a nightmare it was to drive from Upland to Burbank in just two hours, and it shouldn't even take that long, you know? <laughs> yeah, traffic, uh, there's no, I mean, when I was growing up in Los Angeles, uh, there was a reason why they made the movie Rush Hour. Yeah. Uh, because, but now there is no Rush Hour, there's just traffic all the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a good point to make, too. Wow. And so um, you started working. Um, you did um, the, the TV movie of the week, uh, Having It All with Diane Cannon. That's correct. I played Diane Cannon's nephew in the piece. Mm -hmm. And I was a naughty little nephew who thought, I uh, thought, I mouthed off to her in the Thanksgiving scene. I told her, I think I think she looks older. I said, you know, say that Diane Cannon you know, this <laughs> gorgeous woman. So that was fun, and it had uh, Hart Faulkner and Gary Newman, and uh, it was a it was a neat little it was a neat, it was a, that 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 uh, Happy Knoll was directed by Edward Zwick, who yep. later became a very famous director. He directed The Glory, Glory, Tom Cruise, and a bunch of movies. So he became a big movie director later, and that was one of his first uh, forays into directing. About last night with Rob Lowe and Demi Moore. Um, yeah, he he has had a big career. Samurai, I think, as well. Yeah, he's, he's got a lot of great movies. How was uh, Barry Newman to work with? Because I heard he was a very difficult guy. No, I mean, I was a kid. So, you know, when you're mm -hmm. a kid, it's like the same thing. When we did the Ewok movie, the second movie, I worked with Wilson Brimley, and I heard he's hard to work with, but he was nice to us. Mm -hmm. So, I did, you know, but uh, being a child actor, I guess you don't see that. I will tell you this, though, when I was on Webster, yeah. <laughs> uh, Susan Clark and Alex Karras, who played Webster's parents, they mm -hmm. were always fighting. Wow. So, yeah, they, they in fact, uh, I think Alex Karras said to me, like, this, this shows you don't ever work with your wife, Eric, if you get married later, and she's an actress. <laughs> yeah, that's good advice, too. Wow. They were married in real life, too. Even though they right. played Webster's parents, they were married in real life. Right. I think they met on the set of Porky's or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Were you, were, I, I remember that episode of Webster, too. It was the Pop Warner episode, right? Yep. It was the third episode in the very first season. So I knew Webster before he, Emmanuel, before he came famous. And we were friends for a few years after that and hung out together and did stuff. He's a really cool kid. Mm -hmm. His mother, and, and uh, he was the only one that... They thought he was gonna, wasn't going gonna to be short his whole life. Yeah. He had a brother that was real short like him, too, but later in his teenage years, he got real tall. Huh. So, but he never did. Emmanuel Lewis never did sprout up, but they, there was something in their genes where it's usually they, they start growing when they're 18 or something like that, and, but mm -hmm. it didn't happen to him. So. Huh, that's interesting. Yeah, and also uh, Jules Wick directed that episode. He later directed My Big Fat Greek Wedding. Yeah, he's, been, he's done a lot of stuff. So it was neat to work with him. Um, and then I did that, and at that same time, I, shortly after that, I worked on Webster. Um, what else? I mean, I had a terrible... Uh, I had a, They were like family to us, so I stayed with them, and I still love them. But at the time, I had some agents that were a little inexperienced at the time. Mm -hmm. And they turned down some smaller roles in a couple of really big films that I wish they wouldn't have done after I did the Ewok thing. And then later told me about it. Wow. So, do, you want, do you want to mention what those movies were? <laughs> uh, well, one of them was Stand By Me. Oh. Um, what else? Uh, Explorers, the movie Explorers. Yeah. Was offered a part in that as well with Joe Dante. So, but hey, it happened. So yeah, a lot of popular, a lot of popular uh, child actors from that time they went out for those movies. I heard too. Yeah, wow. And I was up for that one role, but I was too old. So uh, I was up for speaking of crossovers. I was up for a role in, on the Next Generation. That uh, that was just a little bit too old for that role. Oh, for Will so, uh, Will Wheaton's part. Yeah. His part, yeah, Wesley Crusher. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's interesting. 
And so how does uh, the Ewok adventure come into your life? I, it was very happenstance. It was real quick. And uh, it was one of those things that just, uh, my, I got a call from the agent. They said uh, they re- I need, really needed to go. It was the same day audition. And it was going to be a general interview. I was only going to meet the director and producer to see if I was the right look. And at the time, they were telling my agent that it was for an after-school special. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was going to be a one-hour movie for an after-school special. And I was going to, they said, just dress kind of casual because he's kind of like a bully guy, the character that's like a bully. And mm-hmm. they just want to meet with you. You don't have to read or anything. So after I, I went down to, at that time, it was at, at the, a place called the Egg Factory, which was across the street from Universal Studios. Now it's a, a subway mm-hmm. parking lot. <laughs> that apparently later I heard that that's where Lucasfilm LA office was. Oh. I didn't know that at the time, but uh, so I went to the Egg Factory. I met John Cordy and, and Tom Thomas Smith, the producer, mm-hmm. and they said we really like your look. I know we said we you know you weren't going to read anything, but if we give you the scripts and what they call them size in the industry, um, can you go study them with? Mm. And you know maybe we can put you on camera so the producer the, another. The executive producer's not here. We want to show them what you look like. And I said, okay, uh, one, on one condition. I At that time, I was, being, I was really seriously studying acting, and I had, I had a monologue. And I said, if you let me do my monologue that I prepared for auditions, I'll go ahead and do that. Not a problem. And they go, okay, yeah, we'll videotape both of them. Well, later I found out that, that the producer accidentally did hit the record button, so they only got the monologue. So what George Lucas saw was this kid doing this monologue where it's a really it's from a play called Acting Out, and it's a very emotional piece. And he's talking about how you know um, he's uh, he's talking about his life and how growing up his uh, father had a heart attack uh, because he called the police on uh, his dad who's beating his mother up. So his dad died in the police car on the way to the station, and it made his mother crazy, and she ended up going into the mental institution. It was this this wrenching piece. Mm-hmm. But long story short, uh, it's what George saw. And about really quickly after that, like within two weeks, they asked if I could do a screen test. Uh, with, And I ended up doing it with Aubrey Miller because they wanted to see how we looked together and how we worked. They also wanted to see if Aubrey Miller was uh, okay. She, they were worried she was going to be afraid of the, what the Ewok looked like too. So, mm-hmm. um, Which is kind of funny because she loved them. <laughs> They're like teddy bears. But yeah. uh, I'm just some, doing a summary of, of this whole event. But it happened really, really fast. And then I did a screen test two weeks later up, up in Northern California. And then at the end of the day, they said, can you give us a few minutes? And then they came out and told us we had to part. And then we were shooting right away. Like in less than a month, we were filming. Mm-hmm. Did, did, so, you, did you spend a lot of time with George Lucas? Uh, George was very active in, in the making of uh, more so than he had been in a while. Uh, he, he was doing a lot of the editing of the piece. He, he did, uh, when we did the reshoots on Caravan of Courage, the first movie, uh, he actually directed the, all the reshoots. So he directed for like about a 10 day period, oh. um, all the reshoots. So I got a chance to get directed by him and he wouldn't tell anybody he was directing. Mm-hmm. So for all these years the Lucasfilm made me look like an idiot to everybody. Cause I kept saying, I got directed by George Lucas and then he would ask Lucasfilm and he said, no, he didn't direct anything. Yeah. And, and, uh, now they don't care because they're letting everybody. In fact, they, there's a new book out, uh, star Wars archives. And in the book, it talks about how George directed the reshoot. And there's a picture of myself and George, George Lucas actually directing me in the book. So, yeah, so you got it proof there. You how things change. Yeah, you got proof there. And also, too, you must have been a, um, a huge Star Wars fan. You must have gotten excited when you got the part. Oh, oh, absolutely. I mean, I was a big Star Wars fan. I mean, at the time, I had seen Return of the Jedi was the only movie I saw because back then they didn't have uh, they didn't have a, a DVDs or Blu-rays or v- they had VHS. They started coming out with VHS around that time. The Star Wars wasn't on home video, so the only way you could see it was going to the movie theater. And I went to the movie theater. I saw Jedi probably ten or twelve times the year mm-hmm. before, so I knew what Ewoks were. I knew I was working on Star Wars. It was a very, you know, pinch me. Am I living in a dream type of <laughs> a moment for sure? Yeah, I was born one week after Return of the Jedi came out. 
My birthday is June 6th, 1983. We started filming June 11th was our first day in 1984. Wow. So, a couple of days after my cool. first birthday in which yeah. I in which I walked for the first time that year. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, that was the, and I was the, and I was old enough to know what was going on because I was a teenager. I was 14 at the time. I'm 50 now. I just turned 50. Audrey Miller, on the other hand, who played Sindel Tawani, my little sister, she just doesn't remember even making the movie. So it's a different story for her. Mm -hmm. She remembers sort of because, of course, they have the movies to show her and stuff, but she doesn't remember too much. She was four and five years old when they were made. Yeah. What were the hardest scenes to uh, shoot? That was, uh, honestly, uh, that was the hardest acting job even today that I ever did because I was on the set every single day. I, in fact, the last day of filming, I was the only actor on set. We, they were doing the underwater scenes where uh, I was trapped <coughs> in the pond. Mm -hmm. So I was the only actor on set because to do those scenes, they rent, they rented a house that had a pool. So I was <coughs> in a, underneath the pool the last day of filming, <laughs> holding my breath. And it was, uh, it was, so I worked every single day. In fact, I couldn't even say goodbye to the rest of the, the cast members or the uh, you know, the crew, of course, was with me. But I couldn't even say goodbye to the rest of my cast mates because I, I had to go to work. Mm -hmm. uh, it was it was very challenging. Uh, uh, I, I, I was always a little bit overweight and pudgy, so they asked me to lose weight. I lost 30 pounds to do the role. So uh, that, was, uh, that was challenging. And, uh, you know, I've had a long life battle with uh, and my family, obesity. Same here. Of yeah, so it's uh, yeah. been a struggle, but uh, I have good years, and the last few years have been pretty good. So, mm -hmm. I'm, uh, but I could always use a, I could always lose an extra fifty pounds. So oh. I'm sure everybody can relate. But I'm fifty years old, so I'm in pretty good shape for a fifty year old. Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah. I, I just I just lost twenty five pounds um, earlier this year, and then when quarantine started, uh, my gym closed, and fortunately it's opening up again. I think next week or something. So I get to go back to my diet after that. Yeah, it's a struggle, but you know, we're keeping it real. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, but, yeah, I mean, I did, I did, and I trained. I even uh, they had a trainer train me. Uh, his name is Bob Yerkes. He he, was, he did all the circuits of the stars. Yeah. Him for that back in the day. So he was training me, and because there's scenes that where I had to, you know, when they 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 the Ewoks put me on the thing and shoot me up into the. Gorax cage, cage or up in the air. So I did part of that. Then another stunt person did the part where I land on the cage because that was too difficult. But I, I still, they shot me 15 feet in the air for that. A lot of repelling, you know, that type of stuff. So for when we were in the Gorax castle, uh, it was a uh, quite an interesting time. And how how long was the shoot overall? I'm sorry, you said how long was the shooting? Yeah, the, the filming. Uh, the, yeah. yeah, the principal photography was about a five-week uh, shoot, and then we did about a 10-day reshoot. Mm -hmm. About uh, a little over six weeks, and then later in August, we were doing the, we did about a week, seven days doing uh, the audio. They call it ADR, which stands for Automatic Dialogue Replacement. Mm -hmm. the technical term. And that kind of ruined me on watching movies for years. I could never go to a movie and not notice when they were dubbing it. Like, ah, oh, man, I couldn't. Uh, it, it literally ruined my experience watching movies for years. <laughs> and I hated it. But because you have to redo the performance inside a sound studio, mm -hmm. and that was difficult. That's that's a challenge. And kudos off to the actors that do it well. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Robert England has said in interviews he auditioned for the role of Jeremy. Okay. That would have been interesting to see him play. It would have been. It's interesting because he and I met each other. Mm -hmm. uh, he may not remember, but he was getting a, 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 an award for V, his work on V right. at that time. And I had, uh, so I have a picture of he and I together. We both got her from the Academy of Family Films and Family Television. I got a special award for acting. And he was getting an award for his acting in B at the time. And I have a picture of us together. He may not remember meeting me, but he did. And I, I remember meeting him. He was a nice guy. Oh, yeah. I've met him. He's a very nice guy. And he, he 
okay. does remember meeting a lot of people. I know that. Yeah. But uh, yeah, back in the '90s, I saw this in uh, Ewoks Battle for Endor on Disney Channel all the time. You know, um, yeah. you you may remember uh, there was a really bad Christmas special of Star Wars in the late '70s, right? I, re- I never saw that holiday special until not too, until recently, but I didn't see it when it was on in the seventies. But yeah, I re- I've heard about it. George, you know, disowns it. <laughs> yeah, and on IMDb, and we know how inaccurate IMDb is. It said that the working title for the Ewok Adventure was the Ewok Christmas Specials. Uh, well, it was called the Ewok Holiday Movie, so they got, came close. Okay. So I, I okay. So I was just paraphrasing that. <laughs> yeah, they came close. And in fact, if you look at some of my, uh, I have a thing that I, 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 it's a limited version of it that I have. This uh, called my indoor journey, and mm-hmm. it has all the call sheets and it has all the uh, scene descriptions. And you can see on it, it says Ewok holiday movie. So um, that's what they were calling it at the time. They thought it was going to come out around Christmas, mm-hmm. but I guess they ended up moving it to November. So George could keep it a uh, not not make it seem like that, and then ABC really it did so well that they wanted to do a, a weekly series, but George didn't want to do it. Yeah. So, uh, but he signed us originally. We were supposed to do a trilogy uh, for, and there was another. There was a thirty walk movie planned. I think it actually got even to the first draft of the first script, but they never. They just they got too busy and decided not to do it. So. Yeah, I think there was an Ewok cartoon at a certain point that, that lasted just a short time. I, I could be yeah, wrong. Yeah, I think they finally talked him into doing that, but when it came to, they talked him into doing that in the droids cartoon as well. They had the droids cartoon. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was the very first cartoon stuff, long before, of course, Clone Wars and Rebels and Resistance. Mm-hmm. How was uh, working with uh, Carl Stryken? Oh, Carl was great. Yeah. Um, very opposing figure, but just a sweetheart of a guy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He's, he's, very he, I, I talked to him last year. He's another Boris Karloff, you know, just a very gentle giant of a guy. He is. He is. Yeah. We recently had the very first big reunion. Uh, I had most of us Ewok actors uh, at a convention in Florida. Mm-hmm. And I was there with Carl just to hear in February. And then the COVID. Uh, the, the the virus thing hit right after that, but we just did a big uh, big Ewok reunion in Florida at Pensacon. It was a lot of fun. So yeah, was Tony Cox there? Tony wasn't there. Tony, I don't see him too much at convention. Tony and I stayed friends for a few years after that, but we haven't talked since. I went to a, a long time. I went to a convention last year, and um, his friend Phil Fondacaro was signing, and. Tony went uh, just to say hi to him, and a poor, poor Phil, everyone was talking to Tony, not him, but I was the only one who came and talked to him in that moment and stuff. I was like, I would love to go over and talk to Tony, too, but he's got too many people around him. <laughs> yeah, because, yeah, he did a lot of stuff, like me, myself, and Irene, and uh, Bad Santa. Bad Santa, Santa. Beetlejuice. A lot. He was in Willow, too, with Warwick Davis as well, and a bunch of stuff. Tony's a great guy. Yeah, I think we did we 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 did a pilot together. We were trying to produce and pitch mm-hmm. years ago, and uh, we so we did that after in like eighty six or eighty seven, and they didn't get picked up. So it's called the Omega Force. It was some uh, it's kind of an action piece. I think I heard Tony of that. Was in it. Yeah, I think I heard of that movie. How was uh, uh, working with Paul Gleason? Yeah, Paul. Paul was Paul was great. Uh, it was weird having a different guy play Jeremiah suddenly, mm-hmm. and uh, the, nobody ever told us why they chose Paul, but later I hear Guy Boyd has told people that they just never even told him that they were doing a second one, because for years uh, they thought it, you know, it could have been and maybe he was busy at the time, he just couldn't do it, he just doesn't remember, maybe he was acting on something else, but uh, but yeah, Paul Gleason was great, um, even though I didn't have a scene with him, we chatted and and uh, had a nice lunch together one day. Um, of course, Guy Boyd and Fanula Flanagan. Fanula Flanagan was the mother. She's done a lot of work. She did, did a lot of work on Star Trek The Next Generation. Mm-hmm. So, um, in fact, with Carl Strickland. I think she did some, uh, something with him as well. 
Yeah. So, an episode he was on. So, she's great. Fanula is great. She gave me a lot of advice as a young kid. She wrote, I, she wrote me this nice personal letter and gave me a lot of good advice about how to behave and, you know, do what to do for my career. Mm-hmm. It's a sweet, sweet letter, kind of like a mo- from a mother figure. And I still have it at the letter she, she wrote me. And, and even George was nice. He wrote me a personal note and a letter, and I have it as well. So. Oh, that's sweet. And then you got to work with the, the Wheat Brothers. Uh, how was working with them? Ah, they were wonderful. I mean, it was, uh, it was a little challenging, though, because, like, one person wants to do something, and it's kind of challenging when two people are directing it. Yeah. Um, but I had a great time with them. They, they took me aside, and they said that they had a lot of plans uh, when they first came in to do this whole adventure with the family, but apparently George didn't want to do that. He just he had an idea, and he wanted to do uh, make the girl like an orphan because... At that time, they had, his daughter and him had been watching that Heidi movie, mm-hmm. so that's the reason why it ended up... But they, they didn't have to make her an orphan, really. They could have just sent the family somewhere else and brought us back. They didn't have to kill everybody. So he yeah. got a lot of flack for that back in the day. You were young, so you don't know, but the critics really, really trashed. It was probably the first time he ever got a lot big trashing by critics. Yeah. Uh, was the way he handled that. It's like... You you spend the you take up an entire movie and you build this whole family up and then you kill them all in the very next movie. I know it's it's weird, but um, I, I I've talked to maybe four people who worked with the Wheat Brothers and they said whatever happened to those guys because they should have been you know big like the Cohen Brothers they were that talented. They were and George had seen a movie that they did, and that's why he wanted them to do the movie. He he had seen some but they had just finished the movie and, it, and I had, later I went and saw the movie too and it was just a brilliant movie I can't remember the name of it oh I know which one, one. Of the we, uh, you know Lies it Lies it was called yeah I think that is it yeah it's a thriller it was, a, it was a great piece yes yeah and and he had seen George had seen a copy of that and, and wanted to work with them because of it um, that's how they got chosen uh, and that's what George did a lot uh, you know in, in and that's the reason why they're, they've had so many problems with hiccups with Star Wars is because it's, he just made everything up as whatever, uh, as it went along. He didn't really write all that stuff. He just it just he just lived his life and whatever he wanted to do, he did. And that's great. That's what filmmakers should do. So I don't blame him. I have no hard feelings. Uh, as a kid, of course, I was very upset that I got killed. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, I was upset that I wasn't going to be a, uh, another adventure. Mm-hmm. As an adult, I understand why he did it. You know, even even myself doing a little bit of behind the scenes work as a filmmaker, I get it. So I'm, that's in the past anyway. But um, <laughs> he's a lot of that kind of stuff, and that's why he picked the Wheat Brothers because he saw their movie, and, and his daughter was a big Ewok fan. So, and I really appreciate the fact that George Lucas made these movies like a love song to his uh, to his daughter. You know, because she loved the Ewok. That's the reason why he made these Ewok movies is because his daughter loved Ewoks. Yeah. Even though he um, sold uh, the, the franchise to Disney before they bought Fox, did you think it was a good move? I think it was because uh, I think he wants to let he wants to pass the torch. I get the concept. He wants to pass the torch to younger filmmakers who, because he's retiring and he wants Star Wars to live on. So I, I really think it's great that he did it. I don't have a problem with him doing that at all. Yeah. I think it's, uh, I think it's a, I, I'm happy he did it. I mean, you got a lot, Star Wars fans are the greatest fans in the world, and then there, there's, there's some of them that are very picky, and they, they have very loud voices. But overall, most Star Wars fans, they do like the new stuff that Disney's doing. Yeah. It's just that little small segment that, as carries a lit because of the internet, they have a loud voice. So what you know, it's like the internet, uh, the the what as uh, the place that Al Gore didn't invent, but it's uh, <laughs> it's it, it's got everybody. Everybody gets a voice, and it's in a way that's a good thing, but in a way it's also not so good. You know. Yeah, I mean, I personally can't get into a Star Wars movie with the Disney logo because that 20th Century Fox logo. What that or 
with that orchestrated music, it really anticipated, you know, it gave everyone a, a shot of adrenaline before John Williams' score came up, you know. Right, and when, when and you uh, and the Americans got, Americans got cheated, Canadians, America and Canada got cheated because even in Mexico, it was in a movie theater, mm-hmm. but it was distributed, like you said, by Fox, so it had that fanfare at the beginning of it. Yeah. It had that same thing as in the Lucasfilm logo came out, just like Star Wars. If you watch the theatrical version, I think now you could kind of see it on the newer DVD they released. Yeah. They went ahead and put Caravan of Courage on it so you could see it now. But when it first came on television, it just said the Ewok Adventure. It didn't say Caravan of Courage because mm-hmm. that was its theatrical release. Yeah. And it was a little longer. I think the theatrical release is a little bit longer than the original movie release. And there's lots of scenes that were cut out, too. And when they re- when they released those on DVD, mm-hmm. it's not on Blu-ray, but there's lots of deleted scenes that nobody's seen that were cut out. That they could put, If they could put some of the scenes together and do commentary, it would be great for the fans. Plus, Warwick Davis, if you've been doing your research, and it sounds like you have, Warwick Davis and I, for a school project, did a making of, behind-the-scenes documentary of the making of the Ewok movie. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. I was going to ask you about that. How did that come about? It was a, the school, the, the set teacher, her name was Ramsey at the time, mm-hmm. it was her idea because Warwick had brought over his video camcorder, and we were already running around videotaping each other. So she asked the producers for a school project because they would rent us another camera, so we had two cameras. And we went around the set and filmed it. We filmed the, uh, the, uh, lots of stuff. Even did interviews. So we interviewed the director, the producer. Uh, we interviewed some of the crew members. Uh, we have about two hours worth of footage total. Probably enough to make a nice little 30-minute or one-hour documentary if we add some additional footage to it. Nice, nice. Yeah. You did... Um you did an episode of uh, the new Leave It to Beaver. I did. I worked uh, with uh, with all the original. Uh, for t- it was uh, they were they were they were calling it Still Wally and the Beaver or something at that time, but later they changed the name. Yeah, but it was uh, yeah, it was fun working with them. I was uh, uh, what's that guy? What was their friend's name? Eddie Haskell. Yeah, Ken Osmond, Haskell. who just died. Yeah, he just died. Yeah, so it was his son, uh, he sent his son off to military school, and I was the bully there that was, and I was hanging his son out the window and, you know, mm-hmm. acting like this uh, deviant type of character. And it's interesting because I just, I always, and even after that, I did a, a, a Disney movie with Mickey Rook called Little Spies. I remember that. that. <laughs> you remember that? Yeah. And I was in the Water Street gang. I was one of the bad guys in that, too. And I think Candace Cameron uh, from um, Full House. Yes, she was. Uh, she was a young girl in it. So uh, yeah, that was. Uh, we were working with her before she beat. She did Full House. Yeah, and you also and worked. I, I was going to say you worked with Christina Applegate on the new Leave It to Beaver. Yeah, I did. I worked with her. I didn't have a scene with her, but I, I remember her on the set and everything, and that was fun. Hmm. Um. She played the girlfriend. I think she was the girlfriend who was upset that he, he was being sent off to military school. But I didn't have a scene with her, but I got to meet her. And then I did. Then I played Robert Downey Jr.'s younger brother, in Less Than Zero. Oh yeah, uh, I gotta ask you about that. How, how how did you get involved with that? I just auditioned for it. It was just an audition, and mm-hmm. I and I went. Boy, they they must audition me three or four times before I finally got the role. So it wasn't, they didn't choose me right away. And then, and I had more scenes that got cut out. I ended up with one scene in the movie, which the scene where he breaks back into his home to try to steal stuff. And I get in a fight, his father catches him. And then I'm in the scene with him and, and we get in a fight and then he leaves. So I, I could say I beat up the Iron Man now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. I mean, that must have been kind of surreal to go from, you know, you, you were doing mostly, um, you know, family oriented stuff. And now here you are doing a uh, hard hitting adult type of, of a role. Right. And at that time I was 17, I was almost an adult and I got emancipated to do that role. 
because I was so close to being 18 anyway, and I was kind of just doing my own thing, earning my own money. So my dad said, go ahead and get emancipated. So I got emancipated so I could work as an adult on that movie. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, was a, it was a great experience working with, uh, you know, Robert Downey Jr., Jamie Gerth. Uh, James well, Spader. Uh, it's going, yes, it's going way back. Um, James Spader. James Spader. Uh, Andrew McCarthy. So, has, has anyone ever come to you saying that that movie made them want to stop using drugs? No. No one has. <laughs> They probably don't even realize that you were in it, probably, right? They did for a little while in the beginning, for a couple of years, but most that movie's been gone so long. I guess people are discovering it more because, uh, you know, of course, Robert Downey Jr. became such a huge superstar. Mm-hmm. So if they're looking for other movies to watch out for for him. But that movie, I guess, that kind of was one of the instigators that got him into the habit he had, which... But maybe he doesn't want to remember that movie. I don't blame him. So, yeah. So, how did you get to play a volleyball player and she's out of control? That was the part that I knew the casting director, and yeah. he just asked me if I would do it. <laughs> so I ended up. I said, "Okay, let, let's go ahead and do it." So, and then it then they ended up cutting out the scene that I was in, but I still get credit. I still get residuals for it. So I'm still getting paid for being in. I'm not really even in the movie. Yeah. Yeah, because I saw it on IMDb. I was like, what? How did you go from, you know, all these rules to that, you know, unless it was a favor, you know? It was a favor for a casting director, and uh, I didn't even audition for the part, so. Did you at least get to meet Tony Danza? I did. I did. Very nice man. I got to meet him, and, and my scene was with him and his daughter at the time, which is, uh, uh, was the uh, the monkey's daughter. Amy Dolan's. Yes, yes. So and she was a nice a nice person, beautiful girl. Mm-hmm. So we were basically, it was in the scene where they're on the beach, and everybody's checking the daughter out, and ended up cutting out of the volleyball players looking at them, checking her out type of thing. Yeah. Oh. That's a that's a great movie. It is a good movie. It is very good movie. Well done. Mm-hmm. And then in 1992, you formed Starlight Entertainment. Did you just decide that um, getting acting roles were were getting kind of hard to come by, so you wanted to get behind the scenes? No. What had happened was because the, when we were doing the documentary from the Ewok movies, mm-hmm. uh, the behind the scenes stuff, that kind of got me. And also, when I went to high school. I kind of started doing, I started directing and writing stuff. In fact, uh, the very first movie, student film I did was a movie called After the War. Mm-hmm. And it stars Anthony Anderson, by the way, from Blackish. So, because, in fact, he, the, when I saw him on the street a few years ago, he was cracking up. He goes, you know, I had that on my resume forever. <laughs> that was my first movie. And I go, well, he goes, th- he goes, thanks to you, I was able to put that on there. Thank you. I go, well, thank you for saying that, you know, but... Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I did a movie. That movie was kind of like uh, the the eighties movie where the Russians attack us. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's that movie? It was kind of the same type of premise, but in this case, Red Dawn. It was kind of like yeah, it was similar to Red Dawn, but yeah. it was after the war and with the we were, the nuclear war happened. So yeah. these teenagers they went on a hiking trip and they get right in the middle of the nuclear war taking place. So the whole piece is uh, after the nuclear war attack, how they have to get to, from uh, to find, get back home and stuff like that. They're trying to make it to the beach to get to where there's fresh air and stuff like that. It's a very dramatic piece. It had Anthony Anderson. Mm-hmm. also had Courtney Gaines in it, who was my friend. We grew up together. Courtney Gaines was Malachi in Children of the Corn. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For that one. Yeah, so Courtney Gaines. a favor to me. And a few other people, Byron Kane in it as well oh yeah um so we we did uh you know it was just i wanted to get i got the bug from george george lucas i could say gave me the bug by doing that first documentary and i was getting into editing and for a long time i worked as an editor and be i've edited quite a few things that i didn't get credit for Mm -hmm. but i've been doing editing and behind the scenes stuff so i did for uh starlight entertainment and we did a, a a movie which ABC was interested in 
picking up, but it was a short, so they wanted us to make it longer, and then I didn't have, it's called Miracle Alley. And mm-hmm. one day I'd like to try to get that piece and make it longer. That's an interesting piece. Yeah. So is there, is there anything uh, that you hope to do? It's hard. It's what? a hard business to get into. It, it, I ended up finding out it's harder, to be, be a, it's harder to be a filmmaker than it is to be an actor. Really? Wow. I thought they were they were parallel, equal. They're you know? not. It's much more difficult to break in show business as a behind-the-scenes filmmaker because of the unions and rules and stuff like that. It's much harder. Yeah, it sure is. So is there anything that you hope to do when um, quarantine is over? Well, I mean, I'm still wanting to do behind-the-scenes stuff, and I'm uh, working on a, a pitch that I'm going to be pitching to Netflix and some other channels. Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of a, uh, it's a kind of a real, it's, it's a reality show type piece, but related to Star Wars. So it's Star Wars collecting, and it's called Sons of the Order. Uh, it might later be called, changed to some other name, but it's similar to Pawn Stars. Nice. <laughs> so, but, with, but with Star Wars toys. So it's, uh, I follow these guys that own, they own a store called Order 66 Toys, mm-hmm. and they buy collections from people, Star Wars collections. Mm-hmm. So, it's a, it's, so it's that type of premise, and I'm in the process of editing the pilot right now to pitch it, but it's oh. going to be a fun show. Yeah, I'd watch that. I mean, that's a great idea, and I don't even like reality shows, but that sounds really, really cool. Yeah, so wish us luck. Uh, with, uh, it's it's, it's going to be good. We've been editing it. We've already shot the first episode. So, uh, yeah, I like to do behind-the-scenes stuff. I just have that bug. That's just... I like doing that, and I compose, and I've always been I've always been a composer, and I write music. Oh, nice. And that's really, other than behind-the-scenes stuff, composing is also a great love of mine. So. Uh, did that start at an early age, too? That did. It started from high school. It started from going to the L.A. County High School for the Performing Arts, and you need to learn other stuff. Mm-hmm. So I would go into the piano rooms and, and play piano for an hour every day at lunch, and I had other people showing me how to play and teaching me for other uh, students. Even though I was in a theater department, I would always be over in the music department. <laughs> that's what I like to do. So, <laughs> and nice. uh, I I just been playing forever. So, and then shortly after that, I bought a keyboard. I got my first synthesizer, and you know I've been playing uh, uh, keyboards and piano since about 1988. So I've been doing a self taught. Mm-hmm. But I hear melodies in my head, and sometimes I dream it, too. God sends me, or an angel, whatever you believe in. I believe in God, because I'm a Christian. Mm-hmm. But God sends me melodies, and I wake up, and I have these melodies, and I get up, and I sometimes if I'm too lazy, I'll hum the melody in a, in, on a recorder that's by my side, a digital recorder. But sometimes I get up, and I actually, I've written some of my best pieces. It was given to me, the melody. And I, and I've, I have three albums out. So I have, you guys, if any of your listeners like, like instrumental, like where you could just chill out and relax, but mm-hmm. also it's very atmospheric, very cinematic music. It takes you away. Check out my albums. I have three albums out. I'm working on my fourth right now. So nice. I'll, I'll definitely check those out, and uh, hopefully the, uh, the the convention scene will start up again. You know yeah. and stuff, and I'll I'll get to meet you at a con. That'd be great. That'd be awesome. Sure would be. Well, Eric, I thank you so much for coming on today. This was a lot, a lot of fun. And, um, yeah, I hope uh, that show comes to full wish, and I would definitely watch it. Yeah, it's going to be great. So let's uh, keep our thumbs up. and uh, I'm sure it's going to land somewhere, for sure, because there's, there's too many places out there that need content now. Absolutely. <laughs> Everywhere we need content. Well, you have yourself a great day. All right, it's a pleasure. Thank you very much, and may the force be with you. May the force be with you. Bye-bye. All right, bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Eric Walker, ain't he a cool dude? Nice guy. Um, Very, very talented, obviously. I just love talking to talented people, and that show, that reality show idea sounds like a great idea. I hope it happens. Um, If you like this video, everyone, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Add me as a friend on Facebook. Join my Tommy Kovac comedian page on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram and all that fun stuff. Well, that's all the time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, There's no shame 
and living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes.